the Bitter Southerner podcast from Georgia Public Broadcasting and the magazine I edit, The Bitter Southerner. My name is Chuck Reese, and this is the fourth episode of our first season. On this episode, how immigrants and refugees are adapting to and changing the South today. The recording studio where I'm sitting right now, in the middle of Atlanta, Georgia, is about 10 miles west of where I live, in a little town called Clarkston. There are 13,000 of us in Clarkston, and we're easy to miss on a map, but my neighbors and I describe our little town as the most ethnically diverse square mile in America. It's a national refugee resettlement area, which means folks from all over the world come to live here. And Clarkston is their first American home. Over the years, my little town has welcomed more than 60,000 refugees. Here are two refugee voices recorded at a coffee shop just a block from my house. Uh, my name is Heval Mohammed Kelly. Uh, I moved to the United States two weeks after 9-11, 2001. My name is Harul Youssef, and I am a Syrian refugee. I do still have friends in Syria, and I miss them, but in, um, in Syria, there is war. In Syria, there is war. Ival and Nowruz are years apart, but they share a close bond. Both are from Syria, but they now call Georgia home. Our producer met them in 2017 when Hival was 34 and Nowruz was only 12. Hival is a doctor, a cardiologist at Atlanta's Emory University Hospital, which sits just one block from where he once washed dishes to support his family after they first came to America. When I came here, I was 18. My mom couldn't find a job because she didn't speak English. My brother was too young and my dad was too sick to work. So I had the ability to work hard and wash dishes for 30 hours a week to support my family. Ival recalls meeting Nauruz in Clarkston in 2016 when he visited her family just a few months after they arrived in Georgia. Uh, when I came to the family to visit them the first time, I met Nauruz and I was extremely impressed by her intelligence and her ability to try to speak English and welcoming people and trying to do really well in school. And I think I looked at a report, it was all A's and she was only here like what, six months maybe. He just asked me which grade I am and what I want to be, if I want to be, if I want to study and all of those questions. Hival sees a little of himself in Nauru's. What I see in her is that she's doing everything she can to get the highest grade possible so she could become something one day and serve her family. So I see the same inspiration in her. She actually inspires me how hard she studies. I want to become a doctor in my future because I want to help all of the children in the world. Nauru's has dreams, big dreams. I want to help my family to learn English or something else. I'm gonna tell the people who just came to America that I hope they're gonna be nice to people and they're gonna make America better too. Now, who wouldn't want a kid like that in their neighborhood? A young girl with intelligence, aspirations, a growing love for her adopted home in America? I would, absolutely. But sadly, I suspect I wouldn't have to look too far to find someone who would not. Immigration has become one of the most divisive issues in our national dialogue. And we'll leave the current debate for the pundits and the politicians. Instead, we want to make a point about the culture of our region, and it's this. I believe that too many folks think they can define Southern culture precisely. They believe they know exactly what it looks like, what its manners are, how its foods taste, how its music sounds. I think those people are wrong. I think you can't define Southern culture. All you can do is watch it and participate in it as it changes, because our culture is a gumbo. Since colonial times, when new people came to the South, whether they were brought here in chains or they came here to find a better life, they have all added to the gumbo that is Southern culture. 
remember what our friend John T. Edge of the Southern Foodways Alliance told us a couple of episodes ago, that the South is a process. It's not a product. So today on the Bitter Southerner podcast, we're going to let you hear some unvarnished stories of how the gumbo of Southern culture is getting ever richer and more flavorful thanks to immigration. I remember three years ago when my wife and I first moved out of the city and into Clarkston. Sometimes I would stand on our little front porch just to watch the people go by. See, my entire adult life has been spent either in Atlanta or New York City, but Clarkston was the only place I'd lived where I could watch folks walk by and not even be able to guess what continent they might be from. Skin tones of so many shades clothing of countless colors and so few of them were recognizable to me and it took me a little while to learn how our little town had been welcoming refugees for more than 30 years our mayor is a great young fellow named ted terry and you might have seen him when the guys on queer eye made him over last season he talked with us about the community We've been receiving refugees since the Refugee Act of 1980, and so we still have Vietnamese, um, you know, now citizens uh, who still live in Clarkston, who came over um, way back in the early 1980s, Somalia, Sudan, Ethiopia. You can chart the course of human events and world events through the people that have come to Clarkston, all the way up to Iraqi, Afghani, and now Syrian refugees. Mayor Ted, a white Southerner from Tallahassee, Florida originally, whereas our little town's nickname the Ellis Island of the South, as a badge of honor. We have a mosque across the streets of Buddhist temple, down the streets of Baptist church. Around the corner is an Ethiopian Orthodox church, a Hindu Buddhist temple, all within one square mile. And yet no instances of domestic terror, no religious wars, no ethnic conflicts. Some Sunday mornings, I get to see the congregation as they stream out of that Ethiopian Orthodox church. Every one of them dressed in white. And I swear, they look like angels. But I guess not everybody sees what I see. In 2017, President Trump issued his executive order banning people from some majority Muslim nations from entering the United States. After that happened, Mayor Ted got a phone call from a fellow Southerner wanting to know more about Clarkston. He said that, um, you know, Mayor, I'm concerned that we're going to have Sharia law in in Clarkston and Georgia if we don't stop all these refugees. And I had to tell him, you know, straight out, as long as I'm mayor, um, we will respect the Constitution and we will not have Sharia law in my city. And he said, well, I really appreciate you saying that I was really concerned. And then, you know, I've extended an invitation to him and many other people to visit Clarkston. Um, I think if you would meet people face-to-face, hear their stories, um, you will understand that there are a lot of Muslims and just refugees in general who have nothing but love and compassion in their hearts. See, Mayor Ted believes the stories in our little town could open the eyes of all kinds of people, including white lifelong Southerners like me and him. I was proud when some leaders in our town stood up in protest of the travel ban. I love America, but I feel bad today. At a city council meeting that same year, Clarkston resident Amina Osman voiced her opposition to the executive order. Originally from Somalia, she lost her husband and children in that country's civil war back in the 90s. Around town, she's just known as Mama Amina. And at that meeting, she had this message for the president. Muslims and Christian was created by God. When God loves his people, You are not supposed to judge. He's not supposed to judge. He's not supposed to just divide us today between Christian and Muslim. One day, he will answer from God. Not long after that city council meeting, I heard from Carly Berlin. Carly was one of the first two interns the Bitter Southerner ever had back in 2015. And two years later, she wasn't looking for more grunt work to do. She was pitching me a story one she wanted to work on through the entire summer between her junior and senior years of college. I'll let Carly explain it to you. I am from Atlanta and knew very little about 
Clarkson growing up, we would go to the DeKalb Farmer's Market nearby and kind of see the the foods and ingredients from all over the world. And that gave me a sense of the kinds of people who lived in this area. But I really didn't understand or have exposure to the kinds of people and stories that exist in the Clarkston area. So in that summer of 2017, Carly met people in Clarkston who were voting in a democracy for the first time in their lives. She also met some who ran for office after they became American citizens, including one man whose candidacy for the Clarkston City Council, we believe, made history. It seems that Barendra DeCall was the very first person from Bhutan ever to run for elected office in the United States. Carly and Barendra met at Refuge Coffee, which is owned and operated, of course, by refugees. I became a refugee in 2002, along with about 100,000 people from Bhutan. Uh, one of the immediate reasons for me to become a refugee was the fear of persecution. I was almost in the fear of getting arrested for my support to the human rights movement in the country. So I came and then uh, lived in the refugee camp, and then I was active there, human rights were, you know, raising the voice, advocacy of the refugees and all that. And that was in Nepal? In Nepal, yeah. Um, what was it like your first time voting in this oh, country? Oh, that was the most, uh, I, I think that was the experience of my life, because that was what we were aspiring back in the country, that's what we have been aspiring back in the refugee camp. Now you are a citizen, you came here, you applied for asylum, became a citizen, and then you have a right to vote in this country, and that was a really great thing. Maybe we can pivot to talking about your running for election in the last few well, years. And <laughs> there were no Bhutanese uh, in, before 2001 yeah. in Atlanta. My sister was here, I was here, so we are the first two. And then slowly, some people from New York and other cities started moving here because we were already here, a kind of community started developing. But in 2008, uh, the United States government decided to bring so many refugees from the refugee camp back home uh, from Nepal uh, to settle here. And some of them happened to be the people I already knew. I used to work with them before. So when I was here, uh, when they arrived here, uh, they, they had no one to go with because we were the first year. Obviously, they would counsel to us for different things. So I started teaching citizenship classes uh, voluntarily to my refugees so that they would be prepared in five years uh, to become citizens. So that way I got really involved with my community and I believe some of my neighbors and some people from the city had observed me, what I was doing. And this, actually it was uh, Mayor Ted Terry, uh, who is now mayor, but those days you were, still, you were also a candidate. It was quite an experience. Uh, I lost by an arrow, but that's okay, and I, mean, I get a lot of experience, and I got to know a lot of people now. So were you the first person from Bhutan to run for office in the United States? Yes, that is correct. Uh, we grew up in a country where you could never utter the word like politics, democracy, civics. All those words were really scanned. I mean, you couldn't even talk about them. I know. And that's why there was kind of movement there and then so many things happened, we became refugees. And one of the things we always asked for was the basic human rights and democracy and that was why one of the demands for us in the camps. But to really practice that, run for the office and prepare yourself to do that, obviously in a country where your religion is different, you look different, you're, you, know, you, do, you speak differently, it's not an easy experience for any other people. But I will definitely encourage my other uh, people, people from my community, uh, you know, to be active in the politics, especially with the voter registration, and support any party they like it, or, and uh, that type of thing. Because obviously this is a great experience for people like us. We have never done this before, and we are in a place where we have the opportunity to do this. What are some of your hopes for the future of Clarkston and the future of the Bhutanese community in Clarkston especially? I think we are doing great. Uh, people have bought houses, uh, they have jobs, be it a chicken factory job, but still they have a job. 
uh, their children are doing well in school, and many of them have, uh, are attending uh, different colleges in, in Georgia. And I think we'll be okay in five to ten years from now. We'll be, we'll be okay in Georgia, yeah. Thanks to Bitter Southerner contributor Carly Berlin and to Berendra DeCall for that conversation. Berendra is a refugee who fled Bhutan because of unrest in his home country. But now we're neighbors. His children have gone on to success. His son is a computer programmer. One of his daughters is a doctor. And another daughter is studying to be a pharmacist. Clarkston is proud of them all because in our little town, y'all, the American dream is real. Assimilation is an odd beast, but it's also beautiful if you look at it just right. New people bring new flavors and they put them in the pot. And the gumbo of Southern culture starts tasting a little bit different. And after a while, we all fall in love with that new taste. We talked in our second episode with culinary historian Michael Twitty. We asked him who owned Southern food, given the South's complicated history. Well, we all know who owned black people in 1860, don't we? So uh, ownership is, you know, in a capitalist society, ownership and fences are very important. We're learning that the hard way, aren't we? So I would say that my answer is very nice and philosophical. You know, who owns Southern food? Whoever is going to take responsibility for owning its past, maintaining its present, and securing its future in a positive and forward-leaning way. That question, who owns Southern food, well, the answer will only get more complicated as we move into the future. So we asked Georgia Public Broadcasting's Virginia Prescott to go to a spot in Atlanta called Shama Gausha to teach us about Shuhasku, a barbecue style that came to us with immigrants from Brazil. Nelsir Mueller is from Santa Catarina State in southern Brazil, but now calls Georgia home. In fact, he just became a U.S. citizen. He's worked in Brazilian barbecue restaurants, or churrascarias, in Brazil and in the U.S. since the late 1990s, and is now general manager of Chama Gaúcha in Atlanta. We joined him just before the lunch rush. Wow, so yeah. this is where the magic happens. Yeah, here it is where we cook all the meats. As you can see, it's, we use real charcoal. This is called picanha. That's our house's specialty. It's a very traditional cut at the south of Brazil. And then we have uh, tabaron sirloin. It's in the U.S. also they call it flap meat. And of course we have the wonderful ribeye here. Also for the red meats, as you can see, we are going to use only rock salt. Just put a little bit of rock salt on it. So no spices? No spices on the red meat. We only marinate a little bit the uh, lamb and uh, the pork cuts. After he salts the skewered meat, Nelsir mounts it on a rack where it begins to slowly turn over a bed of very hot coals. To start, you are going to put it very close to the high fire. This is going to sear the outside and then it makes the keep the juices more inside, uh, helps protect the meat to be more, a little bit juicier. As Nelsair prepares the meat, two of his employees lay out another essential part of the Brazilian barbecue, the salad bar. Jesus Mayo and Andres Batista are hammering ice with a mallet. I mean, the process actually takes maybe like an hour or so, like with me and him. A lot of the people working at Chamagaucha are Brazilian, but these expert ice crushers are from Mexico. But I mean, uh, they speak Portuguese to us, so it's kind of like sticking into it. Yeah. We're, trying to learn, we're trying to learn Portuguese also. <laughs> How's that going? It's kind of good sometimes. Sometimes with Tudo the bem? Tudo bem. <laughs> So how'd you become the ice guy? Well, they just actually, when I came to apply, they just like, I think they saw something in me and they just put me right here. And since then, 
It's so like two years ago I've been doing the ice this whole time with, with Jesus or with Valente. It's hard for most people in the beginning. It was actually hard for me. I took like a whole month just to do it. But I mean, like I'm telling you, like after you get the hang of it, you just, you're just like really, really quick. Back in the kitchen, the first cut of meat is ready and we are ready to taste it. That's the most traditional cut in Brazil, what we call picanha. Picanha. Yeah. When I smell and taste uh, the meat and the, the smell and the flavor, it brings me back home to Brazil. I remember, always remember mom and dad when they were cooking and we grew up cooking. I left home when I was about 20, 22 years old to really put in practice what we had learned at home. We're starting to work up a sweat in the kitchen, so we tuck into one of several private dining rooms to ask Nelser more about the Shuhasku tradition, which, along with soccer and samba, make up a kind of holy trinity of national pastimes in Brazil. I know that a lot of family traditions, they just happen. You don't think about mm-hmm. them, right? So you just grew up with every weekend you would do this? Every weekend, and uh, sometimes just a family, sometimes and small communities where the, they used to gather, like, the, like gather a party for the church, for example, everybody pays a little bit, and then they cook that little, the barbecue, the churrasco, and then the money all went to the church. And meanwhile, meeting your neighbor and your friends, and so it's just traditionally, yeah. And it's mostly men do the cooking in this case, yeah? Mostly men do the cooking of the meats. Usually ladies, mom and sisters, they were in charge of the salads. So it, they start kind of early, prepare the salad, and then if you don't have a rotisserie grill, sometimes the meat needs a little bit longer, half an hour, 45 minutes to cook. That's the time when people sit around the fire and enjoy Chimarrão, which is the green tea we drink at the south of Brazil, or caipirinha. It's mandatory to have a caipirinha before lunch. (laughs) Well, so that sounds like a kind of down-home, you know, um, uh, kind of experience. But restaurants like this, Chama de Gaúcha, Mm -hmm. Fogo de Chao, they're... Mm -hmm. They're fancy places. I mean, this is a, it's a beautiful restaurant. This is some place you would take somebody for a special dinner. Mm-hmm. How does that well, this, homespun thing translate into a fancy restaurant in the city? Well, it all happened when, uh, when I was 22 years old. I moved to Sao Paulo. Uh, things on the farms, agriculture for the Brazil was kind of very tough for a small farmers at that time. So we decided to go after new opportunities. And yes, we had to adapt uh, the way we cook and even some of the salads to bring that experience to fine dining restaurants. And, but the main ideal is always the same, you know, the way we prepare the food. Do most people have a, a, a place to grill, what do you call it? The Churrasquera. Churrasquera. Do they yeah. have those in their home? I do. You do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you don't get enough at work? Yeah, I, I eat meat every day at work and my day off I still grill at home. I really, it's just, I really like it. The okay, you're a tall, thin person and you eat meat every single day? Every day, yeah. So. I think I need to, well, I don't know if it has to do with the food or how much we exercise or genetics could be, I don't know. But really, if you really look our, the way we grill, very, there is almost no deep frying, you know. We only fry polenta and bananas and then we have rice and beans, of course. And traditionally at the south of Brazil, we eat really, really heavy. I wonder at six or seven years old if you thought, I'm going to grow up and do this. Yeah, yeah. and then things changed, you became sophisticated, and now we are here. But the same concept still. Meat, Mm. heat, rock salt. (laughs) Yeah, there we go, you learn it. Customers are circling the salad bar as I sit down with two of my colleagues to sample some of the sides. 
we try the potato salad, mayonnaise, the hearts of palm, the beets, and the tabbouleh, all nods to Brazil's varied population. It is, like America, a nation of immigrants and a country with an economy built on the backs of African slaves, all contributing to its mix of food and culture. The servers are all men. A very delicious fried banana. We also have a, a homemade mashed potatoes. And we also have a fried polenta. Nelser did mention that most gaúcha grillers, or churrasqueros, are all men. And that may be one more point where southern and Brazilian barbecue part company. Along with traditional Brazilian sauces like chimichurri and mint sauce are some nods to American preferences. There's smoked salmon in the salad bar, and grilled shrimp is now on the menu, as is chicken wrapped in bacon. But there's also something no one would dare pair with pulled pork in the U.S. of A. Pão de queijo, or cheese bread. The bread is great. <laughs> Service is awesome. You know, here to have a good time. That's Defatu Chan. She was celebrating her graduation from Lakeside High School with her family. How do you not just keep eating and eating and eating and eating and eating? Well, the thing is, don't eat before you come here. Don't drink anything until last. <laughs> if you drink something, you'll get full. And that's not the point here. The point is to fill up. Yes. You can look at the rise of Shuhasku or any other cultural treasure that is brought here by immigrants in one of two ways. You can be angry and hungry for what used to be, or you can be happy and full of what is. Now, if you believe as I do in the South's legendary hospitality, I think the latter choice is both the logical one and the moral one. And we sure do appreciate Georgia Public Broadcasting, Virginia Prescott, for giving us a story that, frankly, made my mouth water. You can hear an extended version of her interview at bittersouthern.com. Here's the bottom line, y'all. The ethnic makeup of the South is changing fast, and it's just as clear as the nose on your face, according to the Pew Research Center. The U.S. Hispanic population reached nearly 57 million people in 2015. And where is the fastest growth of foreign-born Latinos? Mostly right here in the South. Tracy Thompson is a Pulitzer Prize-nominated investigative journalist. She's also a Bitter Southerner contributor. Early in this decade, Tracy traveled to the South for a book that documented how much our region has changed since she was a child. She says the rise of Latinos is... Still a hugely important phenomenon, if only because the South was so insulated from immigration up until, like, the 1980s, basically. The South had never seen the kind of waves of immigration that had hit the country in other times and places. It's just sort of broke open the bubble, I think. Tracy published a book called The New Mind of the South based on those travels in 2012. That was back when we were dreaming up The Bitter Southerner, and her book influenced us tremendously because it looked at all the way the South's changes remain misunderstood. I believe our choice in the South in 2019 is this. We can resent that change, or we can accept it. As for us at The Bitter Southerner, we've learned that acceptance comes more easily if you're willing to taste the new flavors in the pie. In the second month of the Bitter Southerner's existence, 2013, we published a photo essay by Gregory Miller, an extraordinarily talented photographer in Atlanta. It was called American Mariachi. Greg had been spending many evenings watching the performances of a band called Mariachi Mexicanissimo. For a long time, Luis Vasquez and his compadres, all Americans with Mexican roots, have been a fixture in Mexican restaurants all over Atlanta's vast metropolitan area. And as you're about to hear, even if you want to listen to a song from a Disney movie while you enjoy your margarita, 
they can accommodate you. They'll just do it mariachi style. We sent our producer, Sean Powers, to revisit our friends in a little joint in one of Atlanta's suburbs, Lilburn. My name is Luis Vasquez. I play the vihuela. It's a rhythm guitar. We're called the Mariachi Mexicanísimo. Yo tenía mi cascabel en una cinta morada, en una cinta morada. Yo tenía mi cascabel. We play all around in Georgia. The, the Latino population has grown probably five times, six, seven times since we started playing. We, we've tried to play a little bit of everything, rock, classic rock, some pop songs, you know. Whatever comes out, we try to stay up to date and still play the, the traditional classic American music and the traditional mariachi Mexican music. Growing up, my uh, my father's also mariachi. Actually, I'm a third generation. My grand my grandfather was uh, also mariachi. If they could see us, they they're probably uh, wouldn't like it too much, you know, because some uh, mariachi players are really like um, they they want to stay keep it traditional. But you know, since we're we're over here, we have to adapt and you know give it our our, our little seasoning to the music. You guys ready for a song? Yeah, make a request. What song you like to hear? Pick a song. Let it go. Which one, honey? Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. All right. <laughs> Snow glows white on the mountain tonight. Not a footprint to be seen. A kingdom of isolation. And it looks like you're the queen. My name is Adam Wasatowski. Uh, this is uh, my wife, Estrella, and my daughter, Ani. We pretty much come here every Thursday, minus Thanksgiving, Christmas, and maybe one other Thursday a year. Specifically on Mariachi Thursday, because we really appreciate their music. Well, now they know. to move with the times and with your location. They're here, they're in Atlanta, which is really, I mean, when you think about it, the, the uh, percent population of Latin American is so high here. You don't, and you don't really think about that, but it is. So you've got you to gotta be able to cater to that, you know, and, and not just that, but everybody else, too. Here I'll stay, let the song rage That story, again, was produced by Sean Powers. And at Bittersouthern.com, you can find a link to all of Greg Miller's beautiful photos of Mariachi Mexicanissimo. You'll also find the words that our friend Peter Short gave us to accompany those photos. And a few of those words are perfectly appropriate to end this show. Tradition and culture, Peter wrote, sustain themselves not through purity and absolute preservation, but through introduction and acceptance. That's it for us today. We always want to hear from you on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. We're now more than halfway through Season 1, and we'd like to know what stories you want to hear in Season 2. Get with us. Let us know. You can subscribe to our show anywhere podcasts are found. And even if you don't use Apple's iTunes to listen, a rating and a review there helps us a lot, and we'd sure appreciate it if you'd write one. You can also hear us at bittersouthern.com. 
That's where you can read our stories and, of course, check the show notes for this particular episode for links to our stories, the ones that can help you go a little deeper into the immigrant south. Our producer is Sean Powers. Sarah Shariari edits the show, and we thank, as ever, a whole bunch of folks at GPB for helping to make every episode of the Bitter Southerner podcast a little better. One last big thank you to our former intern and current contributor, Carly Berlin. She's out in the real world now, working in New Orleans, and we are as proud of her as we can be. Ever South, our theme song was written by Patterson Hood and performed by his band, Drive-By Truckers. Additional music came from Blue Dot Sessions. The Bitter Southerner podcast is a co-production of Georgia Public Broadcasting and the Bitter Southerner magazine. I'm Chuck Reese, and my three instructions remain constant. Hug more necks. Abide no hatred. And always, do what you love with who you love. We'll be back with Episode 5 in two weeks. Mm -hmm.